evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sydney Professional Development Forum, or uh, PDF as we like to call it. My name is Jeffrey Wang. I'm the founder of PDF and the moderator for this evening. So tonight, I'll be providing uh, a bit of a brief overview of PDF, uh, introduce the topic and our panelists tonight, followed by a Q&A session. We're going to be aiming to finish around 7.30 to 7.45, and uh, you'll be welcome to join us for a bit of an informal networking session afterwards if you, uh, if you, if you care to. So, uh, just a little bit of background about PDF. Uh, PDF was established back in 2007 by an ambitious group of young professionals trying to get together to uh, decode the secret to success in the modern Australian workplace. So at PDF, we believe that everyone, not just the elite few, um, should have access to the right tools, techniques, and networks to develop, develop themselves. We believe that by becoming the best version of ourselves, we will lead a more fulfilling life and inspire those around us to do the same. And we do this by running events that aim to inform, connect, and inspire and share what we have learnt with our community through social media and podcasts. So I'd like to acknowledge first the uh, PDF team in the room. Can you please put up your hands? So, the volunteers down the back. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor this evening, Haymarket HQ, who has kindly lent us this space for this evening. Um, so Haymarket HQ is a uh, co-working space. Uh, focus on uh, uh, Chinese uh, ventures to do with the, uh, the Asian century in China, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, now just a bit of housekeeping, as a courtesy to our speakers this evening, I would like to ask if anyone in the room is here in a journalistic capacity to please identify yourselves. Okay. Right. Now, if you are a journalist, uh, I'm not going to ask you to leave, just, just say you're here. Um, so tonight is uh, not your typical PDF session. We're actually being very, very excited because, uh, firstly, because this is the first time we are holding this as part of the City of Sydney's uh, Lunar New Year Festival. That's the first reason we're excited. Secondly, we're excited because we hope to play a part in shaping the public discourse of the Australian workplace culture as part of this discussion. Because in the, over the past 10 years at PDF, we've often talked about uh, stuff that we can help ourselves at a personal level. We haven't really focused on, you know, so, so we've been focusing on, focus, focusing on things like soft skills and you know, some more, more our personal things that we can do to help ourselves. But tonight we're going to be discussing the more controversial topics that involve a broader, much more broader cultural issues. So tonight's topic is why aren't there more Asian Australian CEOs? According to a 2018 McKinsey's Workplace Survey, Asian American professionals are the most likely of any group to aspire to promotion and think that they will get there one day, but they are also the least likely to be promoted to management. Anecdotally, we also know that this is true for Asian Australians. So what is preventing that desire from translating to actual advancement? This, this mismatch presents a tremendous opportunity for leaders and organizations. In the war for talent, Every talent matters. What is not obvious are the benefits that we miss out on if we do not make the most of what we've got. The term bamboo ceiling has been coined to describe this phenomenon. But is the lack of Asian faces in leadership simply a visible symptom of a much wider problem? Diversity activism has been on overdrive to the point of fatigue, yet there is hardly any agreement on the solution. Should quotas and targets be used by advocacy groups for gender equality adopted for racial diversity? Is, di is diversity advocacy just self-interest? Or is it even possible to have an increased Asian representation that does not come at the expense of other minority groups such as Indigenous Australians? So to debate on this sticky topic, we are delighted to be joined by three titans of industry whom I have enormous respect for. They're three of the most experienced and successful leaders of an Asian Australian heritage. So I'd like to introduce our panelists for this evening. First, we have Charles Cho. Charles is the general counsel for, Treasury, uh, for New South Wales Treasury. 
Now, you might know him better as a past speaker at PDF, where he shared one of the most intriguing stories of a legal career that has been littered with more bumps and bruises than most of us experience in a lifetime. Now, fortunately, Charles has a, has a happy ending. He's discovered a renewed sense of purpose and fulfillment through public service. And so, to give an idea of the scale of his responsibility today, New South Wales Treasury manages a $77 billion budget and a balance sheet in excess of $330 billion. Not many people can claim a responsibility of that scale. So, thank you, Charles. And next we have uh, Ken, Ken Wu. I'm sure many of you know Ken, uh, because uh, he is he's the OG, he's the, uh, <laughs> he is a trailblazer. He's the first partner uh, of Asian Australian descent in PwC, and in fact, he's probably the first, he is the first partner of Asian Australian descent in any of the big four in, in Australia. So, uh, yeah, so he's been in it for a very long time. Now, he's an antithesis of the common adage, don't rock the boat, because he loves to push boundaries and have some very uncomfortable conversations, which I'm sure you'll enjoy this evening. He's a legend in the advocacy circles and has been an absolute champion for it for many, many years. And thirdly, we have Raul Data, who is a director of digital services in Service New South Wales. Now, Raul is responsible for the, dig the digital driver's license, so some of you might have actually experienced it recently, which had a huge, huge, and congratulations, successful launch. Um, now, what I noticed about Raul was that he created a team with an exceptional culture, and then he noticed that there was incredible diversity within his team, but not because he went out to look for it, but that just happened to be a, a byproduct of an incredible culture, um, and that's just icing on the cake. Now, Raul is an understated leader. He is very personally humble, despite having some phenomenal results within government. So let's put our hands together this evening to welcome our panelists. <laughs> now, we will be open to Q&A this evening. Uh, to ask questions, please log on to the Slido app, sli.do, so if you can get the Slido app open. The hashtag this evening is Sydney PDF. Right, and that again is Sydney PDF. You can use it on the browser as well. Uh, you can use it on the browser as well, so slide.do and then just type in the, uh, the, the hashtag. If you, um, now please make sure you, ask, you enter your name when you ask a question, so we can invite you up to ask a question. Now, if you wish to remain anonymous, that is fine too. Uh, ask the question, uh, for, ask it on Slido and I'll, I'll, I'll ask it for you. So, uh, and remember to in engage with the, um, with the questions and upload those questions you want, most want answered. Okay. So, without much ado, let's kick off the discussion. I'll start by asking each panelist, is there an underrepresentation of Asian Australians in corporate leadership? And is this a problem? We'll start with Charles. Well, I think that's pretty obvious if you look at um, most boards across Australia, most, uh, I guess, uh, in government um, sort of senior circles, there is, um, you know, the composition does not reflect, um, I guess, the percentage of Asian people um, in Australia. Um, I don't think that's a problem that's unique to Australia. I think that's a problem that exists for most Western countries. So um, I think it's easy to say um, that there is lack of Asian representation which reflects a proportion of the population. That's just a fact, I think. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that there's a lack of representation. It's very interesting, but when you start to think about is this a, a problem? Um, because if we want to get together and we want to console ourselves about the outcome, yes, there's definitely a problem. But if you want to do something about the problem, then it's very important to understand the perspective of the audience that you are trying to influence. They may not necessarily perceive it a problem, and here's a few reasons why. It's in the 1950s and 60s, and then in the 1970s, we came out of the um, era of the white Australia policy, um, almost in a way to say, um, in the exhaustive use of the white Australia policy. This was a period of committed prejudice in Australia. So when you understand the dinner table discussions that happened around that time, sanctioned by then you can understand how people can start to talk, which is 
that um, um, this outcome is not surprising, and so therefore why is it a problem? Because it's the form and default of which I grew up. Then you translate that today, and, and a lot of people will think, well, I go overseas on holidays and I can see uh, lots of people who are in low paid jobs who are in socioeconomically disadvantaged situations. They're very subservient, and I go over there and I can find this job. I get housemates, I get drivers, I get all sorts of so this reinforces this. Finally, um, look at the attempts that have been made to bring about change in health policy. And what happens there is, is that you need to bring about change by owning the narrative. But the narrative is never forced upon everybody. It's the narrative today is, is that um, we can have a conversation about advancing health and diversity, provided and only provided that. I feel good, and I never feel a sense of culpability in doing any wrong because I don't think I've done anything wrong. And therefore, it will be restricted to food and festivities. But at some point, we need to own the narrative, we need to move the conversation. It's something a little bit more constructive around the outcomes that are going to be there. The challenge is, is that if you don't have enough advocates who are prepared to step up and bet their career where the counterparty risks are slap on the wrist, sometimes you've got to take against the odds of this. And this is, now let's be prepared to do that, move the conversation, and change the narrative. This affects the overall assessment that the status quo has on the capacity of people with Asian backgrounds to actually become members. That leads to then a, a conclusion of comfort, which is um, the reason why there aren't many Asians in the state now is because they don't seek these positions and they're not good enough. Somehow we need to get very tactical and very strategic first thing I think that um, is important to understand is presenting this as a problem is not a good idea. If you ever go and see your CEO, it's always a good idea to try to think of how you're going to present a win-win situation to the CEO. Take a lose-lose scenario and disengage it and run with the They're going to say to their assistants, I'm not sure that's what you meant by this. So how do you frame up a win-win? And the win-win involves thinking about the problem in a very creative way. Thanks. Um, I actually, uh, when you asked me to sort of, you know, present here, um, I can honestly say I hadn't actually thought much about this topic at all. Um, so I went away and started doing some research and started Googling, and is this really a problem? Uh, so I actually have a question for the audience here. So how many of you think this is an important topic and diversity is really important? Awesome. Uh, the reason that's good is because that's actually kind of, that show of hands is representative, representative of, of what Australians think. So it's not an exceptional uh, thing to think about. It's quite normal. Everybody, most people in Australia thinks it's a good, think it's a good thing, and that's based out of, this, out of many studies that have been done recently. Um, now, uh, I can't, I'm not really good at remembering numbers, so I kind of took some notes and I, I, I got some numbers in there. So, um, and, and, and we talked, talked about arguments. Uh, you know, I think we have to first lay the context of why it's important. You know? um, uh, it's it's good for us as human beings because we all want to be respected and valued for who we are, not not for anything else. For, for who we are. So, culture, our ethnic background, it's all, it's a part of us, and we want to be respected because of that, not in spite of that. Um, and um, uh, the other thing is that it's it's good for business. And it's also good for society. How so? If you ask me, uh, there has been um, uh, uh, studies in Australia um, by the Diversity Council, which has actually found that uh, workplaces that are inclusive, uh, that actually um, have, and because of diversity, because of reasons, are about 19 times, uh, they cause 19 times more happiness to the people compared to workplaces that are not. That's that's how. That's just it. How are you sure that's not the other way around? Is it, yeah. the, is, is it the chicken or the egg? Do you have to have a good culture before you have diversity or the other way around? I think that there's an underlying assumption that it, uh, you know, a good culture is naturally diverse. Um, um, I challenge you on that one later. Um, the second thing about, yeah, so the, the, the second thing about um, how is it good for business, there's been studies that actually have shown uh, that um, 
companies that are more diverse in the population uh, are actually 25 to 30 uh, percent, you know, better in in their profitability compared to others. And companies that were at the bottom quarter of that study are actually again 25 to 30 percent worse off than your average organization in profitability. So, and that's actually also, you know, it's been proven. And the other thing, how is it good for society? Uh, there have been studies uh, in the in the United States um, for the last 50 years, which has actually demonstrated that reducing the racial inequality uh, has actually resulted directly uh, in about 20% productivity. So, so there's been a huge number of, uh, there's a huge evidence out there that says it's good. And there's a whole lot of support um, in Australia for, uh, you know, uh, diversity. Uh, but um, unfortunately, one of the problems is at the top brackets of our organizations, um, the representation of, uh, and I'm speaking not just for Asian Australians, I'm speaking for general diversity. Um, uh, there were two studies done, uh, one in 2016 by McKinsey, one in 2019. I think 2018, and uh, what we found that it's not only that there is uh, not enough representation of uh, uh, the, the boards and the top brass of the organizations are not, not not diverse enough, but it's also been proven that it's go getting worse. It's not getting better. So uh, the two studies that we can see, the second study was worse. Right. Yeah. Can I just quickly add to that? So um, I actually think there's a problem that comes about because if uh, all these economic benefits. All the community think that diversity is, is the right thing to do. And why is that outcome not happening in business? So let me just give you an example. And, and, um, if you've ever been to Seoul, um, if you've ever been to a place called the Chilla Hotel, when you're at an intersection across the road from the Chilla Hotel, there are four lanes of traffic. Yep. And on the other side of the intersection, there are only two lanes of traffic. So it's really interesting to see what happens when the lights go green. What happens is everyone just smacks their horn, and there's just this incredible chaos. But somehow, four lanes become two, and this is actually what happens in business: is that you've only got the spot for two people to be promoted, and you've got four, ten candidates, and you're going to have a lot of ill going on. So the question then is: is well, what happens? Because in the community, we require a lens of fairness process, but in business, somehow that changes, and we get distorted out. And I suspect that it's something to do with the fact that in business, it's almost like a religion in business to pursue something that's meant to be good, called efficiency. And efficiency means what's the best use of my time. So when it comes to leadership selection, who's going to be my successor? Very easy. The most efficient way to do it is to know what is the expected outcome. And once I know what the expected outcome is, what is the most efficient way to expedite that outcome? It is. Most of the, um, expected leader, uh, who I'm going to pick a most efficient plan, is someone in the image of today's leader. And the most efficient way to get to the expedited outcome is to make assumptions about them, which favor that outcome, and make assumptions about others based on stereotypes, negative assumptions, but lock them out. And this efficiency process leads to these kinds of outcomes because it's not in the it's not the best use of my time to spend it with people who are not like me, who I don't know very well or to expand the current lens of leadership beyond the image of today's leader. So it's very important to understand the why, because it's only when you understand the why, you understand exactly then how difficult it is to approach the very people you are trying to change, particularly when organisationally, and this is one of the big structural problems, those charged with responsibility to bring about that change report into the very group they seek to change. So if you think about some of the things that happened in the past 12 months, about conflicts of interest. It's very, very difficult when you've got conflicts of interest between do I do what I need to do to move towards the outcome and change the conversation, um, or do I actually just back off and then get my promotion for being you know, very good at doing good and best duties. So I think you're ahead of me, Ken. I was going to ask you why why you think that's the case. I mean, you know, knowing that kind of makes sense to do diversity. Why aren't we doing it? So, Charles, I'd like to hear what you think on this. So, I think firstly, we recognise that um, 
like attracts like. So um, it is human nature that you tend to be more attracted to people who are like you. I think that applies to whatever racial background you are. So if you do have a board of a certain composition, um, you tend to um, attract the people who are like because in one sense, people don't want to disrupt the status quo. So if you see a board, uh, a management committee, where a lot of people like you, it's going to be more easier for you to apply to that. And also, it's going to be easier for people to hire you on that basis. The other thing is, in my experience is, as you go up the management ladder, um, uh, meritocracy has less of a percentage influence on why you get chosen. As you get up the ladder, it's, it comes down to things like fit. Is this person uh, have, have a good fit for our organisation? Um, is this person aligned with our values and visions? Um, is this person going to be part of my, I guess, um, political group within the organisation that will support uh, you know, the group of us? Every organization has their little groups and subgroups. Um, and so what you get to as you get higher is objective meritocracy, which I think um, from a high school perspective is what you're used to. You sit exams, this exams are set anonymously, you get a mark and you, know, you are chosen based on, on a mark and not your, you know, what your background is. But as you go up the ladder, um, you know, how do you get chosen to a board? You don't sit a test. People select you. So I think the selection criteria and the method becomes less and less about meritocracy, but more about who you know and whether you are like them. So if I could try and sort of replay that back to you. So it seems to me like there is sort of a continuum from sort of ignorance to malice, you know, as, as the reasons for why this diversity is reflected and it seems to me that both of you seem to believe more on the ignorance side of the scale is people don't know the value of you know the, the diversity that could bring to them or they don't know that they're missing out on something right so if we can sort of zoom in on that and see what would you suggest as ways to uh, communicate the value of what an Asian Australian leader brings to the table and I'll just um, spell out the context in this. There is a, um, there's a study on CNN, there's an article on CNN that recently was published uh, that examines the CEOs that have recently taken over in Silicon Valley, a lot of them from the, Asians, uh, from the Asian descent, uh, from Google to Nokia to uh, Microsoft uh, to Palo Alto Networks. And they listed nine reasons for why these CEOs come to the rescue. And out of the nine reasons, and I'll read out what they are, Number one, acceptance of change and uncertainty. Number two, see, seeing around the corner. Number three, all about metrics. Number four, education in STEM. Number five, work as family and the original helicopter parents. That, that requires a bit of explanation. Number six, diversity. <clears throat> Number seven, authenticity and adaptation. Number eight, time orientation. And number nine, believe in meritocracy. Now, I just noticed with the exception of diversity, none of those things are exclusively Asian, nor, nor exclusive to the Asian culture. So are we at the precipice of a completely new leadership paradigm? You know, should we be looking in different places for leaders? And that part of that requires us to look in uh, the you know, people of Asian, Australian, uh, Asian descent. Um, so it's interesting because some of that leadership journey, I remember in high school, um, you know, I was, at a high school we have three batches of prefects. We have first batch, second batch, and third batch. They choose 12 for the first batch, and um, it's always a coveted position. Um, and I remember um, I was in E10, and I was really wanted to get that uh, position. And But, you know, people will come up to me and say, you won't get it, you're Asian, and we've never chosen before. Um, now that kind of galvanized me. Um, so I did everything that needed to tick the box to get that prefectship. And it's painfully obvious um, that if I didn't get it, um, it's actually really embarrassing to the organization if I didn't get it. Um, so 
I think when you are confronted with that, you tend to work hard. And I would say for a lot of Asian people in um, you know, those kind of roles, um, we come from a background, particularly our generation, where we had to work harder to get those particular roles. Now, I don't think that is necessarily the case. I mean, you talked about malice versus, versus ignorance. Yes, there are uh, you know, people who, um, and you'll see this at the moment with the tribalism going on at the moment between progressives and conservatives and the rise of um, extremism, that there, there is malice um, uh, that is not more evident in current society. Um, but then I think in terms of this corporate Australia um, and sort of large organisations, very rarely is it about no malice, because if you publicly say that, you won't have that job. Um, but I think it's more about, um, and I have a particular experience where um, there were two people um, who were being chosen for a particular senior role, and I recollect having discussions with some colleagues on why did you choose this person um, uh, who happened to be Caucasian versus another person who happened to be uh, Asian, um, and the Asian person was a lot more the Caucasian was a lot more egregious, and you know, he was up really, uh, he, you know, it's sort of out there and uh, was just more funny. Um, and so, again, that comes down to fit. If you're at the same level and the same skill set, then you know, it's about fit. And that's, and, that, and that's quite a hard thing because, in one sense, if you're trying to create a certain culture um, and you think this person is going to fit the culture, that is a legitimate um, way of, of, of choosing. But at the same time, uh, one of the things that you know about leadership is you need to be hiring people who are challenged. If you just hire yes people, then actually it's bad for you as an organisation. And and there are some leaders who accept that. So there are leaders out there um, who will you know advocate for um, at the moment I see women uh, in leadership because they say well you know, male champions of change is a big thing that's happening because they do recognise that they the diversity. Um, and being challenged in their own views addresses their blind spots. Um, and that does apply not just to gender, but to race as well. So I, 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 I agree with everything you've said. A lot of that um, resonates very strongly. Well, when it comes to these reasons why they pick these CEOs, now, let me get some, some context to what I'm about to say. You know, when people ask me, so you know, what, what sort of um, have you really been focusing on lately in, in, in some advocacy for cultural diversity. And I tell them I specialise in an area um, that there is some um, um, covert misconduct. And when people say, what do you know about covert misconduct? I said, well, if you ask me, um, have I experienced covert misconduct or any kind of misconduct in my career, you know, I'll strenuously deny it. Uh, then I'll always add, um, and even if I had, I'd still categorically deny it. And I do that just to basically in a situation where I'm not making any accusations and there's people wondering, did I or didn't I? And I haven't made any accusations and there are forms and ways of communicating. This is all about what Charles is saying. How do you find a way to fit? How do you even find a way to communicate? Because the boardroom communication is something where you're in an environment where everything is minuted. So you need to be able to convey an important message about what goes down on paper when something is going to be alarmist. So to learn that, understand difference between black and white and grey and how to communicate that to them is very important. It's also important then not to do too much second guessing because you can't really make um, actions based on second guesses. But you've got to be aware of these things. So when I hear the nine reasons that have been given, um, the most um, immediate thing that comes to my mind is there are really good reasons, but I wonder what the real reason is. And a lot of these when they're startups, um, they're, they're startups where they're in trouble. The last thing you want to do, if you're in the mainstream, um, and you've got a great run ahead of you because you're going to get all these opportunities, why would you pick the poison chance? Why would you pick the startup which is about to go bust? For that kind of poison chance, the kind of person who would take that on would be someone like me who would say, I'm not too precious about the opportunity. If I get the opportunity to take this position, I'll take it. And against the odds, I'll turn it around. And I do realise that as soon as I turn it around, it'll be given to someone who's actually just walk into the role and replace me. But let's not get precious about this because there's an outcome we're seeking, that outcome may take a generation, and it needs to have some tough people who are going to make the inroads so that everybody else benefits. 
that's yeah. actually part of the way I was brought up, which is that uh, you must do everything uh, by your generation, so that the next generation prospers, particularly your kids' uh, generation. So this is the way we're brought up to think, and this is the way that uh, Now what's interesting is, is that they, they, this will come back at you, because I always believed I had to work 10% harder, and I did work 10% harder. And when I used to say to the boss, you know, I get a lot of bill bill. No one will go in here. None of this is going on. You're just making that up. But interestingly, um, when I put my hand up to become the, uh, the team leader, uh, the response was pretty quick, which was to say, uh, you know, I got a lot of feedback immediately from your peers. And they're actually very concerned that if we made you the leader, that you would seek retribution on them for the misconduct <laughs> that never happened. <laughs> so all of a sudden, what never existed suddenly existed. So it's just an understanding and, and it's not getting precious about it, it's just how I say, it's just like, uh, stay calm and, and get tactical, be strategic and move forward, but let's not be naive or ignorant, let's not hold ourselves by rationalising that everything's okay. It's about understanding that response and 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 response Knowing that um, the odds are against you, and they get beat, they get beat many times. Keep coming back, and um, actually, when the leaders are watching you through that process, they actually develop the respect for you because they realise that you're someone, uh, you're someone who, when the times are going to get really tough, um, is going to be there. The other thing, the reason why this is very important, is because if you are confronted with situations where you have to play against the odds of death to stick up for yourself, and you don't. The team are going to look at you and they're going to say, well, if you can't stick up for yourself, how the hell are you going to stick up for me? So sometimes you just have to do things. You don't do them. And you want to have a team to follow you. And one of the most important things for your team is to demonstrate that people will follow your lead. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely right, both of you. And um, uh, I, I just remember a couple of sayings. There is this old Chinese saying, and it's, if you're from Chinese background, you can confirm that. It says uh, the, the flying goose gets shot, or the flying duck gets shot. And then there's a Japanese saying that says uh, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. And uh, then there's an old uh, English saying that says the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Has anyone heard that? So, yeah, so that, that kind of explains the difference in cultures and attitudes. Um, and, and absolutely, you know, in agreement with both of you, that you've got to stand up for yourself. You gotta make noise about it. You know, it's uh, if you think it's not correct, don't be, don't think, oh, am I the Asian person complaining uh, about you know discrimination and will it be seen as you know maybe you know uh, uh, you know selfish? No, it, uh, you have to speak up for what's right, and you just have to say it. And the more noise you make, I think the more you'll be noticed. And uh, and, and it's a generational thing, it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, you know, I'm old enough to know that. So um, it's going to take time, but uh, one of those things, you know, you talked about efficiency and familiarity, is that the more um, diverse faces that you see in your organization, uh, the more examples there are, the more comfortable you are with the concept. And, and it becomes easier for the next generation. But it's, uh, it's always a little bit harder for the first generation, because you are there, you're not in the leadership yet, and you have to stand up for yourself, and you have to demand it. I think it's really important. Okay, so thank you for that. I just want to check my understanding, Ken's story, um, based on that. What you're saying is that there is no, you know, there, there is no silver bullet. There is nothing that will happen until you make something happen, uh, and that's what you're encouraging us to do, even though it means that we will, we will have to be uh, we will have to work that much harder. We will have to endure more elbowing on the way up. And uh, just to just to clarify, you never sought any retribution. No, and, and, and in fact, um, I guess some uh, observers of me would say, you know, Ken develops very big ideas and seems to pursue these big ideas. And some of them are pretty crazy ideas, and some of them is just waiting for his time. And um, there's a reason for this, and that is, is that. If you want to um, squabble away, you can squabble away. But if you take the view that there are so many great things to be done, there just isn't enough time to squabble. 
And so every time I am tempted to stop them, and um, you know, I'm a youngest child, but I'm really good at this. As long as they do something, I'm special this too. But um, I decide not to because it's better to focus on the big picture. So we can all hear you. So, no, that's great. Um, and I guess you've already got onto a little bit around the advice, you know, for, for young professionals. And I'm sure, you know, this is sort of typical of PDF. We want something to walk away with that we can we can use in our careers respectively. So I suppose you've already covered it. Some some of it is that, that we've got to have more. But is there any sort of secrets? You know, obviously you three uh, have more been the exception rather than the rule. So there must be something you're doing right. So, you know, I suppose in, in, in a room like this, is there something you can share with us in terms of the principles or things that we need to be doing in order to, to stand out? Now, this is um, taking into consideration the, the cultural um, programming that we tend to have, you know, the, the loudest that gets shot. Um, so is there any way we can do this without sort of compromising what is intrinsically us, what makes us who we are, you know, when we're told you know, be humble, because that, that's something that is incredibly important to someone of an Asian upbringing. Is there somewhere for us to succeed without having to sort of chuck all that, your know, cultural virtues away at the door um, and, and be somebody who you're just not, you know, is, is there any advice on that? That's an interesting question because um, at a particular forum I was at, um, one uh, response to why there aren't more Asian leaders and Asian CEOs was because um, Asian people don't want those roles. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, um, shall we say, booze and disconfrontation about that statement. But when you step back and think about it, um, for the generation that came before us, what was the one thing that your parents said to you? Go and get a safe job. Be an engineer. Be a doctor, be a lawyer, you go in there, work hard, get a professional job, give us babies, and you know, our immigration success story is there. Um, so there is this, um, for Australia, which hasn't had a very, you said of the high Australia policy, we haven't had a very long, um, sort of, I guess, we don't have fourth or fifth generation or a large percentage of people like that. So there is still this, um, you know, old, um, sort of duty to your parents of getting a safe job um, and because in one sense going for the CEO role as Ken mentioned is an elbow job there is only one CEO role and there's a lot of people who fall by the side it is a risky proposition it is not safe and so if you're on the path where should I be um, you know, a, a sort of safe professional job um, you know, be a doctor or engineer or should I go into going for those management roles where it is hotly contested. Um, in one sense, and typically when you, and you'll note that um, when you go for those CEO, CEO roles, there's always four or five candidates. Only one makes it. The other four go. They don't stay in the organization. Once you go for those roles, you are no longer welcome because you went for the role. You are a potential competitor. And so that is the risk that you take. Um, and so, I guess from our parents' generation, we've been, we've been, I guess, somewhat conditioned to play it safe. And so one of the recommendations is, well, how do we have more um, Asian trans CEOs is, well, take more risks. I think that's what I would say. Um, take more risks. And I, I talk to a lot of um, sort of young professionals, um, especially in the consulting space and the legal space, and they say, look, I'm not happy. Um, and they go, well, okay, you're not happy, why? I'm not getting promoted, I'm missing out promotion, okay. Do you think it's because you weren't doing well enough? Well, I think it's, well, I don't think so. Then why don't you leave? Oh, no, I can't do that. Um, you know, I worked hard for this, and, you know, it's in a prestigious, you know, sort of top four, and, you know, it's, my parents are very proud of me being here, you know. I can't go that anymore. So sort of my own consultancy. Oh, okay, but you're not happy. So there is this sense of um, whether from our immigrant parents or less risk taking. So coming back to what Jeff said, take more risks. I think do what you want to do, what you think, um, rather than what your parents want to do. Um, that's my. Now, I, I um, 
every time I fancy world something, I'm, I'm a world champion at coming to the great rationalization um, of why this happened and what happened to me without realizing that I had been in control of the environment. So um, and earlier in my career, um, um, I noticed and um, I, I had so much work to do. And I was, <coughs> I was getting uh, kicked at the bum for being late with my work. And in fact, um, I got to a point where um, my boss came in one day and said to me, um, have you um, ever thought about um, um, whether you really enjoy this quality of life where I come in here and I pick up the bum before I even give you the work because I know one thing. And I said, what's that? He said, that's what you respond to. And he said, the sooner you learn that people will treat you according to what you respond to, the more uh, you will learn that you're actually in control of your environment. And I said, how so? And he said, well, you think about this more. You won't get it straight away, but I will always can ultimately, and probably later than I would like for your own good, you, you are stupid enough to figure it out. But I figured it out for us. Um, I'm going to just um, try um, with a different um, audience, not my tech clients that I work for, but it could be your audience, the people I work for, just to um, do and prioritise work according to how nicely they ask you to do it. And um, I started asking my colleagues, why are you doing this thing I gave him um, yesterday, right now, and the thing I gave two weeks ago, He's actually been told by the boss to do things according to how nicely he does. That had huge change on my entire life because all of a sudden all these auditors who were my enemies became my mates. And of course, they became my mates. That's what the problem is for, which is my attention. I get on with everybody, and not everybody can do that. And it's because I understood that important piece of advice. The other interesting thing I'll share with you is, is that when I um, deal with my colleagues from um, Singapore and Hong Kong firms, um, this idea that um, I'm humble and I've got to be soft and um, I do things like I, I fire with water, I throw fish cubes at ice cream, that, that, um, so I feel ice cream cube to the side. And that's my solution to it. Um, that doesn't have it. And they're not like that at all. We want to have a tough negotiation um, with some of our um, partners from our offices in our first region. Um, there's none of this humbleness. And I don't do this, I don't get aggressive. That's not the way I was brought up. There's absolutely none of that. And the reality is, if you're not prepared to actually um, meet the situation according to the situation appropriately, with appropriate conduct, um, and with appropriate um, um, tools in your, in your kit, and a very important tool is a sense of humor. So it can disarm situations and, and, and draw people to you and allow you to engage with them. And you need to build up these tools in your toolkit, and you absolutely then need to power with these tools in the hands of this. I think, I think the argument that both of you made is amazing. Um, I was thinking about one thing. Um, I mean, the first thing that you want to do when you, if you, if you really want, want a leadership position and you really want to go for it, first thing you have to decide is that you really want it. You know, it's really important. It's not because uh, I'm, I'm the agent of student and I want to be the leader. I don't think anybody thinks like that. It's, a, it's like, do you really, is that something that you really want? Um, and, and then the second thing is about, yeah, if that's something that you really want, then, then you've already justified it to yourself that you, you deserve it. And then you go for it. I have, you know, in my last 10 years, every time my boss left, in most occasions I could have had saying, can I? Okay. 80% of the time got knocked back, saying, oh my, I don't think you're up for it. <laughs> Fine, okay, move on, okay. But always give it a try if you think that's what you want. But there have been situations also when I said, no, that's not for me, you know, and I don't want to do it. Um, so I think that's a personal uh, decision, but I think there are some guiding principles. Um, secondly, um, uh, nobody likes a colleague that's a competitive push, you know, pushy colleague. Nobody likes a colleague like that, okay? Uh, but there was a study done in Canada a long time ago, and where they actually proved that it's even worse if that colleague is Asian. <laughs> so, I'll tell you why. Uh, and it's a, there's a bit, of a, a bit of a dark side to it as well, which is uh, um, uh, there is a, this cultural expectation, you know, it's a, it's a stereotype 
that the Asian person next to you is is a nice gentleman or you know lady who's who's going to be very quiet and you know be very diligent about their work and never complain about stuff. And but if this person suddenly comes across as aggressive, talkative, oh no, that's not what we expect from you, right? And unfortunately, that's that cultural stereotype. It's actually real, and uh, and the studies that are done in Canada has proven that um, the same behavior by a non-Asian person would be considered absolutely okay and acceptable. Um, uh, you know, depending on where you come from, if you're Latino, it's like yeah, that's a, that's how you behave. Uh, or from the Middle East or from India, but uh, if, if you're from Asian, that's not on, and it's offensive. So just be aware of the context. So so yeah. okay so. Uh, I get that there is obviously how other people perceive you based on their cultural expectations. Yes. But is there anything that's within our control? Like, you know, I, I like this idea of cultural competency where, you know, we can sort of almost meet you not just halfway, but 75% or 100% of the way. We could be completely confident, you know, with your culture. You know, the further I, I find myself sometimes going into regional Australia on a sales call, and the further into the bush I go, the thicker my Aussie accent got, and um, actually that was American, but um, <laughs> but is there, is there an effective way where we can engage cross-culture, and can that be learned? So I'll give you an example of it in a different context, that is the, so I, I think it's very important to surround yourself with people differently to you, so you can learn a lot from that, it's just about it. My wife got this huge promotion, and um, um, I said, well, that's fantastic, so what's the new title? And she said, oh, it's um, Acting General Manager. And I said, well, why the acting? Aren't you the General Manager? She said, yeah, I am. I said, well, why acting? She said, because I asked her to be acting. And I said, why would you ask her to be acting? Well, it's your role, and you've got the role, so you should take the title. So it's where you, with your stupid male ego, driven on you, don't get it. <laughs> she said, here's the reality. Um, and the reality is, um, I'm general manager MA. And um, this is an MA team where everybody is known. And three of the people in the team with the most senior people expected to get this role. So they're not going to be happy with the fact that I've got this role. So I need to basically win them over and I need to show them I can do this well. So if I take on the acting role, it won't hit them so hard because, oh, I've just got all packs on and I've got this role. And guess what? If they don't like me and it doesn't, it doesn't go well, well, I'll just step back and I'll go in the other acting, so it doesn't matter. I, I don't do space and I can go back to being general counsel. Uh, but if it goes really well, we'll just drop the acting. No, 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 no. So isn't that a win win? And I just said, oh, yeah. so, so, so you and your dumb, you know, you've got a driven approach. So that's what you would have done. And then so you would have had, I don't know. I win or lose. They are part of the win win. This is how someone who just thinks differently does this. And so it's important to understand that it's in all of life and your perspective. It's very limited to just what you happen to be thinking based on what you discuss with the people around you. And if all the people around you think like you, it's not the same. So it is important, and this is why the benefits of Perspectives, be they cultural perspectives, be they any kind of diversity that you can think of, it's a diversity of thought that's important. Thank you. And, and that's a great segue. I um, just want to remind everybody Slido, hashtag Sydney PDF. Uh, I'll, I'll go to the questions from the audience now, seeing as I think uh, we're, <laughs> we're certainly getting a, a lot of pearls of wisdom and, and certainly uh, some great things we can, we can use in our own uh, workplaces. So I'll start by inviting Arvin to uh, ask his question. Well, thank you guys. So it's really enlightening to know all the input from great leaders. So my first question is, uh, being at the top leadership position, it should give opportunities to more Asians. Uh, but if it could be misunderstood that there's a favoritism in there. So how do you deal with it, that you give more opportunities to Asians at the same time that you're not misunderstood, that you're giving some favoritism to Asians? 
So that's an interesting one because um, my two deputy general counsels who I've recently appointed in the last two years are Asian. Now, um, one happens to be also from my ex law firm. Um, so, <laughs> one, so it was interesting because I, there, there was some insinuation at a particular function that I was playing favourites um, on both fronts. Now, the thing about the government service is that um, one of the benefits of the government service is that the process by which they're hired, you have to document every decision. And so it's pretty easy for me to justify that it was meritocracy, not favoritism. Um, but what, I, what is really interesting that I have noticed is the fact that I'm of an Asian background, um, the um, applications that I get, say, versus other areas, I get so much more diverse people applying for the roles in my team. Um, it, it's just um, yeah, amazing. I, 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 we're at the moment I'm hiring two lawyers. Um, and I, just on the basis of the surname, I can tell it's just a, such a diverse um, background. So, yeah, I, I think in terms of, um, again, the more diverse the leadership, the more diverse you, you tend to attract. And, for me, it's making sure that um, not being embarrassed about having more diversity, um, but making sure that your own processes are, you know, is based on meritocracy, so that you can't be, you're not doing what you, know, you actually don't want like others are doing because it's just because you're in that position. I think that's important. So, you know, this is one of those ones where um, sometimes you like to say that's a question I would rather than avoid answering, but um, I, I think you do need to, to answer it. So sometimes I would say, depending on the um, body language of the person asking the question, I would say, well, only those who are succeeding um, with the benefit of opportunity that others don't get and at the expense of others are the ones who will be worried about that kind of thing. The ones who will always get through. The other thing to do is, because um, um, I'm very numbers driven, um, it's the difference between um, focus and targets, which is not very well understood. Here's what I think is the difference. If person A has got 10 units of opportunity and person B has got two, and if I take two and pass them over, then it's eight and four. Right? And if targets don't achieve that kind of um, equalization of the opportunity, that's good. But if you have a situation where you're going to take eight away and give it over here, and then you have ten and two. Uh, that's a distorted outcome, and that's actually um, what is known as positive discrimination. And here's the difference: if you have targets, the targets will make you stop when it's equalised. The quote is because you just have to keep driving forward with focus. These targets are aspirational. Would mandate that you keep going. So there's a difference between targets and quotas, and this is not very well understood. It gets very emotive very quickly. So the key is, is to understand technically what the issue is and then very calmly explain it. Um, but then if um, someone wants to keep escalating it, then you've got to actually feel the advantage and say, oh, what are you saying? Do you want to be stupid? And it's different ways and, 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 and it's the first way is to play the scrap back. And then it's to think about the techniques to use to say, okay, I know what you're trying to do here. Um, and then I've done my bit, which is just where I've come to live for a little while and now I'm just going to see. For you a little bit just to show you. Okay, so I've got an official question here, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it says, Ken, can you please hold your microphone closer to, to you so we can all hear you? <laughs> all right, now, uh, I've got a couple of anonymous questions, uh, which um, are pretty good. So one thing is, um, and I kind of really like this question, what can we do on a daily basis in our corporate life to help promote this kind of conversation? And I, I take it by this kind of conversation, it's not the uncomfortable conversation, but useful uh, helpful sort of tips and, and sort of honesty and I suppose respect in, in, in how we deal with differences. So uh, I think uh, you like to offer some of Yeah, I think I think we've got to, we've got to talk about it. I think that's the first thing to do. I mean, don't be shy. Just talk about it. It's very important. I mean, I've, I've been personally really lucky because um, I work in an incredibly diverse organization, you know, uh, and I've seen, um, I've seen us 
um, you know, proactively discussing quotas, etc. I think uh, Ken, your organization has done amazing work. I, I, I think in government, it's really not there yet. And as you say, we are still a little bit behind. But I think uh, we have really um, forward-looking policies. And a lot of the conversation, uh, obviously there's been a lot of discussion on gender um, balance and gender diversity. And it's a, we talk about positive discrimination. And it's absolutely, I completely 100% agree with why we need that. And, uh, and I've seen the conversations change. I've seen the actions change within the organization. I've seen how we are positively, positively discriminated against, um, you know, uh, for getting more, um, uh, you know, gender diversity into the organization, more gender balance into the organization. And, and this wasn't always like this. This wasn't like this 10 years ago, you know? And we are having a conversation, and it's okay. It may not have been okay five years ago, but it's okay now to talk about it. And I think it's just a matter of talking about it, raising it in every forum, and, uh, and I think that's the, that's the way to do it. Yeah. I'll just quickly add, look, there's a, uh, this, this requires a bit of, bit of strategic thinking. And why I say that is because when I uh, started doing the um, top diversity of many parts in, in many companies, and look around, and no, no one's around anymore, so I wrote for them. And um, so the last thing I would suggest to anyone who wants to do something about this is to actually become a cultural diversity leader, because that's one of the most difficult, challenging roles. You need a particular set of strategies something in it. What you can do, you don't want to go down that path of trying to do the other stuff. It's a very hard decision to proposition. Is to understand that in, in, to bring about these kinds of conversations, um, you need to own the narrative. And the narrative at the moment um, that um, leads to this state of, of just going around in circles, um, and what I call is going from sea level to base camp. You never get any further than base camp because by the time you get to base camp, you go back to sea level. Food has to be an announcement of our intent. And we're going to do all of this, uh, but, but, but applause, applause, celebrate, you know, and get back to do it all again. But when are you going to go beyond that? And so um, um, I'm saying that um, you know, we've done a lot of PwC, and then about two years ago we stopped doing the food festivities because we didn't set targets. And then you said we start doing the fun ones. We don't do the fun ones. Um, big targets. And that's changed the mindset. Are we doing all the food and festivity? Are we doing the base camp? See, so look at the base camp routine now. We're going to be able to try and get out and so on. So I just ask, just politely, and say, when are we going to start doing these things? Uh, and not accept that all we can do because we've got no budget because we've got no great policy things. Uh, that um, we're going to just do food festivities. Just a reminder. Oh, sorry. Put close to you. Yeah. Okay, next up we have a good question from Kai. Um, yeah, so uh, what's a bigger barrier, um, being prejudged just in your skin colour alone or your, or your name? Like people take a look at them and say, Ken Wu, pass, right? Or Asian guy, pass, or Asian girl, pass. Or is it because of some of the traits that are pretty common to Asians, such as being quieter or less self-promoting? Um, and the reason I ask that is because um, I, when I look at um, many of the people who struggle to do well, I can't help but notice that a lot of them tend to be very quiet people. Now, personally, I think there's enormous benefits to quiet leaders. Uh, I know that's been an event here in the past. I've met some quiet leaders who have amazed me with how successful they've been when I always thought you had to speak up. But nevertheless, it seems to me that if you were to solve the issue, um, if you think it needs to be solved, of Asians tending to be quieter, they tend to be less extroverted, um, they're less, less, you know, they tend to be less self-promoting. If you were to address those traits rather than Asian-specific policies and targets or whatever it is, I would feel you'd probably eliminate maybe 80 to 90% of the problem. Am I wrong? Can I, 
Can I actually say something about it? I have a difficulty with the philosophical basis of the whole thing. Is that um, I don't think it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just the appreciation of it. Um, I worked in a Japanese company for many, many years, and we had a very different set of values. And um, who is to say that a particular set of values is better than another set of values? A quiet leader is worse than a you know extroverted leader. Um, it just it could be the culture and norm today, but if the leadership mix changed tomorrow, the norm would change. So uh, what we value, uh, and I don't kid ourselves by saying that um, um, you know these set of values are desirable and those set of values are not desirable. That's because that's just something that you're looking at through the cultural lens of today. Uh, Ten years time, if the mix changes, um, the the set of values that are desired might change as well. And that's what I think. And philosophically, that's my view. Um, I I don't subscribe to the fact that. Um, uh, there is a certain set of behaviors that are, you know, absolutely the best set of behaviors to get desired results, and that's why we need the diversity. That's why we need to change some of these values as well, and uh, need to start respecting quiet people more. You know, need to start appreciating the fact that quiet people can make great leaders. Okay, that's that's how the perceptions need to be changed. That's that's my personal view. So okay, I'm going to follow up on that because. I've got this theory that um, there's a lack of diversity in leadership full stop. And that's not just racial diversity or gender diversity. There's a lack of, say, introverts amongst leaders. You know, I've got this theory that if we were to make um, leadership more uh, accommodating to introverts, we would naturally see more Asians and women and you know, other minority groups in leadership. Do you agree with that approach generally? Absolutely. That's a good question. That's a great because question. it comes down to what is it that makes a good leader? And I think um, you got to and that, the answer to that question differs from organization, and the answer to that question differs from the cultural context in which it comes. But if you have a brash Texan American go and become a leader of a Japanese multinational corporate, won't work. Likewise, if you have um, a similar a Japanese executive who's lived in Japan most of his life, and, um, and he would went to a Texan oil company, so culture and what that culture considers leadership is vital. The question for this audience is what is the Australian culture of leadership? And is that something um, where, I get come back to the question, the quiet Asian who doesn't rock the boat, is that an appropriate leadership candidate? Now, I would say at this point in time in our cultural context, the answer is probably if you are the quiet person who doesn't rock the boat, um, you are less likely to get leadership. Why? Because um, if you look at a lot of the leadership positions um, in Australia, it is someone who's confident, who's outgoing, um, who um, you know needs to elbow out other people. Um, and the other thing is, um, it's about playing the vicious game of getting to leadership. You don't get to become a leader by um, sort of, I guess, just working hard. It's about getting the consensus of people to support you. If you're CEO role, making sure that the board knows you and that the board supports you and that you are the preferred candidate. And that requires a lot of backroom chat, that requires a lot of, you know, the journey to the CEO, CEO role just doesn't happen. It's going through very you know, many management layers, it's going through becoming during the border of you know not for profits having that experience. Now, the thing is, I think it is a truism to say in the current Australian culture, if you are quiet, then yes, you are going to be disadvantaged. Whether that is the correct leadership style um, and, and effective is an open question. But I think to say at the moment in the Australian society, you, you just got to accept that. I think that is true. I think regardless of whether you're, you're, you're quiet or 
reason. Um, my observation is, is that um, the most effective way to advocate your strengths is actually not doing it yourself, it's for others to do it for you. And the opportunity that white people have is, is that um, they are the ones who more need others to advocate for them because they're not prepared to do it themselves. But find it, they, they must, I'm just starting to tell you, yeah. but find it, they must because um, people will not accept you as a leader unless they know that you can stick up for yourself. Because if you can't stick up for yourself, how do they can you stick up for them? And so they want to know that you're prepared to, to, to fight. How you fight is a very different thing. And if you can get someone to advocate for you, that's very powerful. I'll give you an example of the director of my team. And um, people think she's very quiet. And she's Asian and, and short. Uh, but um, she has this remarkable, um, two remarkable um, aspects about her which make her a great leader. Uh, one is, is that somehow she turns every bad point into a good point. I'm not sure how she does it, but she wins them over. She does it in a way where the clients then actually, she trains the clients very well, and the clients actually behave very well. It's, it's quite amazing. Because there's a lot of advisory views out there, right? And so she's very good at, at, at managing this. The second thing I've observed, and I say this to people when they I'm bringing it back to the story that you're in control of your environment. If anyone asks to do something impolitely, she just doesn't do it. As a consequence, people only ever ask to do something in the most polite fashion. It's amazing. I just watch this and I think, that's amazing because, you know, me, I just go, oh, do this. And then that won't happen with her. So she's totally in command. And people can see this and the serenity that she brings in the way that she does things. And the junior is absolutely not this person. So then, um, as someone who's observing this, what do I do? I agree with very strongly for this, this person because I can see a different lens of leadership and a lens which brings a lot of diversity and a lot of value to our team. Sorry, uh, chat. I don't know what I wrote. Um, are Asian cultures predisposed towards overt leadership from a Western perspective? Or are our cultures predisposed towards being part of the collective? And, and we are uniquely in, particularly Sydney, for example, we are uniquely whereby uh, Asians are not necessarily regarded as a minority anymore. The numbers, the sheer numbers of Asians living in Sydney is so large that there is this danger that Asians don't actually interact with anybody else other than themselves. That may be true in certain parts of um, Australian society. You go to Parliament, Many Asians are there. Um, you go to, um, I guess, the media outlets. How many Asian faces do you see? Uh, I think that the issue is that yes, we do have um, a large proportion of Asians in the population, but there are segments of society, um, particularly the political class, where there's a dearth, um, and you know that is an issue. Um, and then you, and one of the questions is, why is that? And I guess one of the factors in is, how many parents, when you were growing up, said, be a politician? <laughs> yeah. One of the things my dad told me is, never be a politician. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. I went to a careers night, which was held in um, Strathfield Town Hall, and it was a careers night for young Korean teenagers. And, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might remember that one. And, and, <laughs> The, the deputy mayor gets up and he's a Korean, he's a politician, and he said, and, and before we start with our guest speakers, I'd like to encourage you to think about a career in politics. And I was sitting next to this fellow who's a, who's a, um, a surgeon, and he was going to talk about um, uh, becoming a specialist. So I did my bit, and I, I, I found my bit, and he gets up, and, and he's quite funny, because what he's done is he's saying, here's what you do as a specialist, depending on the kind of person you are, um, so, you know, so he said, if you don't like conversation, you know, become a linguist. And he went through all the different, um, all, all the different specialties, and it was quite funny. Um, and then he said, um, but if you're in it for ego, um, there's no one here. You have to become a politician. And he hit it on the screen. <laughs> so he couldn't take it off. So there's this very uncomfortable situation where there's this deputy mayor thinking, ah, oh, so you just think of it, you know, this is what you think of, of, of me. And, and he just couldn't change it. So it was quite amazing. Using special moment, but you're absolutely right. It's not one of the it's not one of the careers that, um, um, that Charles and I would have been encouraged to undertake. I, I heard an expression. Um, you know, you, you've all heard the expression bamboo ceilings. Uh, 
also an expression called the sticky floor. And the sticky floor is all about um, getting into those safe jobs um, and and being in these professions, very technical, very you know um, uh, professional, um, and um, and that's possibly also one of the reasons why you know the pathways sometimes can be limited, and that's the sticky floor that kind of you know keeps you stuck to the floor. Um, how many Asian parents have you seen encouraging their children to take up a sales job? So yeah, so I think. I think that cultural element is always going to be there, and it's not going to change overnight. Once again, uh, you know, uh, first generation, second generation, third generation, it takes time. But you know, some things are what they are. I think one of the most effective things you can do in your day job at the moment is um, it, with this effect on Asian CEOs today. But um, the more diverse your organisation um, in any factor. The, the, the more diversity will just naturally happen. So um, I think in terms of, at the moment, there's a focus on women. Great. More women there are, more diversity there will be at senior levels. That in itself will create diversity in other categories as well. Um, and it's because diversity itself breeds diversity. Um, and the really important thing is you can't be that shrill voice in the corner um, saying, you know, I need more representation of my particular category of, you know, whether it be race, whether it be gender, whether it be disability, whether it be certain sexual orientation. Um, you need to bring other people on the journey with you. So the important thing is, for those people who are there in position, it's about convincing them and working with them to basically bring about change, because you can't bring change in order by yourself. And how do you then um, get them, I guess, to think about this. As people say, talk about it, befriend them. It's, at the end of the day, it's a personal thing. Um, and the more they see you, and more understand you, and some of the challenges you've gone through, and the more they say, wait a minute, why didn't you get that promotion? And if you didn't get that promotion, and if you're the only one who kind of feels aggrieved about that, then nothing's going to happen. But if you don't get that promotion, but you've built up the network to say, and part your team says this is really unfair, you're going to bring about change. But that requires you to develop, I guess, cohorts, compatriots, um, leadership yeah. skills. Fair enough. Um, okay, Teresa, would you like to come up and ask a question? Now, just bear in mind, we're, we're almost out of time, so last chance to get your questions in. great aspects and great qualities of being in Australians or Asians in general. My question to you would be, um, how did you come about to find your sponsors, your advocates in your careers and different stages of your career? Has there been any challenges throughout this journey as you actually climb through your corporate ladder per se, or maybe you expanded across, it wouldn't probably be that linear. Um, so my question is, with humility and these values that we do hold, uh, how did you go about finding these sponsors and advocates for you? I'll answer that. So humility must not be your only virtue. If humility is your only virtue, then you get nowhere. Um, humility needs to be backed by other virtues, um, such as uh, resilience, um, such as um, steadfastness, um, because you can be humble, but you don't necessarily have to grow. Um, so I remember um, a particular very, very senior executive, and um, you know he was famous for basically um, making people cry. Um, and uh, you know, my second day in, I met with this executive, and 
It's not about, you know, sort of being flamboyant, um, but, yeah, you know, I had to give him advice, and I gave him advice he didn't like. And it was really interesting because, um, you know, I wasn't, I, I said the advice, I knew it was going to be advice enough, but I just I said, that is my advice. And, you know, I kind of didn't know whether the next day I was going to get called in and said, you know, I don't think there's a role for you. Um, but one of the things as the general counsel and as, as a lawyer is, it's very important that you give advice that you think is right um, and independent. And so you can be humble, but you've got to make sure that you also, as Ken kept saying, stick up to what you believe in yourself. Um, humbleness is an attitude of how you present things. It should never be capitulation of what you believe in. It's a very fundamental principle of uh, do you uh, live on your knees or die on your feet? It's not every issue that you'll uh, adopt that mentality that you've got to pick them. You've got to pick about very carefully and some are not negotiable. And the unfortunate thing is, is if you're unnumbered, you'll be presented with more of these than your fair share. And that's very difficult for them to present a different way. So I need to form what is absent from a lot of people because they haven't had a go, which is judgment. So you learn, you calibrate that judgment by taking risks and failing, getting back up again and you know, tell the next time maybe I'll do something different. So that didn't go too well. And unless you start to get that experience and never get the judgment, you never try it, then it's coming to know. So that's an, that's an important for me, when I remember when I started, I, I just looked around the, the floor and I could see some really talented senior people. And I just thought, these skills are just dripping off the walls and I want to learn these skills as much as, uh, as quickly as I can. And it just occurred to me that um, uh, approaching someone and just saying, like, I just um, really admire the way that you ran that meeting and I think that this um, is going to carry it to you there. What, what's, 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 what's the one most important attribute for all that? And in that process, you are actually um, uh, you're actually complimenting that person, and uh, they're inclined to actually help you when they realise that you're hungry to learn a new skill. Um, the thing that adds to that, I think, which is very important, is to make yourself interesting. So if you make yourself interesting, then uh, the conversation can break up, and the conversation can continue, and then when you next edit, it can continue where you left off, and that's very important. So. I only know about Appendix 5 and, and the accounting standards and the technical detail of it. Uh, that's not going to give to, it's not going to create a very interesting conversation. But if you're well up in the news and then what's happening, and in particular what the priorities of the senior people are, that's very, uh, that's really good. The other thing that's really important, and I learned this one from my uncle, who was a CEO, um, he said, um, I always have a joke in the story of every situation. Because when I'm sitting at a table um, at some function, um, I'm expected to lead the table, and I lead the table with jokes or stories and conversations or play or being prepared. So um, somehow, if, you, if you're good at doing that, um, you can draw people to you, and it's about being um, interesting. I think it's a very big part of it. Absolutely. Um, I've met tons of people in my career, you know, people who have worked with me, people who work for me, people I work for. Um, and um, I know some really good people who've done amazing work, but never told anybody about it. They, you know, uh, you know, if you ask quietly, some people know that they've done some amazing work, um, but they never talked about their achievements. They never actually went and said to anybody how good they were. And I personally know a lot of people like that. Um, and many of them have been Asians. Um, and I, 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 I actually walk up to a lot of people and say, you've got to tell people what you do, you know? Um, and these days, most workplaces have, you know, social media and this and that. We actually encourage people. Now, it's not just a, you know, problem with if you're Asian background. A lot of people have this, you know, fear of talking themselves up. And uh, so one of the things we encourage is, you know, make a little video about, you know, the work that you've done, you know, and, and just post it. Let everybody know about it. If you're, if you're, you know, shy about talking about it, you know, put a video in there and just tell people about it. If, you, if nobody knows, you know, um, you know, it's about that you know, tree that falls in the forest, and nobody's seen it, nobody knows. So, I think 
So I have as a principle in my opinion that everybody in my opinion needs to present. Um, and so we had a 19 year old secretary um, and um, she just come out of um, sort of college and she said, I'm, I'm your executive admin assistant, why do I need to present? Because I said to her, because that's a skill that you would actually use for life. So I had her present in front of the parliamentary council office. She was terrified. Um, but I said to her, look, People are not born presenters. It's a skill that you learn. Whether you're introvert or extrovert, um, there are certain skills, corporate skills, that you need to learn in order to succeed. It's a presentation. Program. So for all my lawyers, I um, pretty much require them, I think, to learn how to present and actually put it out there to make them present. And it's that, you know, there's still some of them still uncomfortable, but um, you know, to say you're an introvert. I can't present. Well, that's one of the key skills you require to be an Asian. Um, I think um, it's not really your Asian, non Asian. No, not, not from, personally, I think if you want to be a leader of people, whether you're quiet, humble, extrovert or not, you need to be able to present the vision and the principles and the goals of your organization in a way that people can readily understand. That requires really what race you are. Can I tell you a quick silly story? When I was at university, I worked at Grace Brothers and they had, they had a hardware stack. And um, they gave us this little sales booklet one day. And the sales booklet said, you know, when the customer approaches you, try to be three things prompt, pleasant, and interesting. And somehow I remember this be prompt, pleasant, interesting. So I was always prompt, pleasant, interesting. So this Thursday night, and there's this guy in, in, in there, and I'm, I'm prompt, pleasant, interesting. I go up and have this conversation, and I'm trying to be interesting. Uh, I'm telling you all the wonderful things about this Makita 10 million uh, hammer drill and, and, and uh, going on. Anyway, and so he asked me what I'm doing, and I tell him what I'm doing, and, and um, I discovered he's retired. And, and I said, How can you be retired? You're only like you know, 38 years old or something. He said, oh, I used to make barges. And I said, Oh, yeah, who'd you make it for? He said, Oh, for the salt in the Bruno. I said, Oh, well. So anyway, he invited him around his house just to show me the, the things and introduced me to his family, and, and, and this was in my fourth year of my five year from, from law degree. Then I forgot all about him. And then ten years later, he calls me up and says, I they tried to find you and now that I found you, I, I want to get some advice from you. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, what advice would you want from me? So I found a property. And I'm thinking, well I don't do conveyances. He said, no, 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 this is a property for a colleague of mine. So anyway, this colleague comes in and actually he wants to buy a shopping centre. And so I'm sitting in this meeting and I brought him on because I'm at the stage of senior management, the partner says to this guy, I said, so how do you know Ken? And he said, he sold me a drill. <laughs> <laughs> and then the partner, who was our boss, who actually became our CEO, just looked at me and just said, shit, mate. <laughs> it must be one good drill. All right, so I think, um, uh, do we have time for one more? Or, uh, how are you guys feeling? All right, last one. Nick, would Nick like to come up to the stage? Nick? So Nick did. That's what I was going to say. No, come on. That's, that's, I think it's a good place to finish. Um, this one's for Charles. Uh, it was a, a mention that you, that, that you said um, about the management ladder. Yeah. Um, I think basically, in a nutshell, what you were saying is, is how you find the more political becomes. Um, I suppose the question there is, are Asians good at playing political game? Look, a career where I'm from, um, the, that political game is even more vicious in some Asian countries, I think. I think political games are everywhere. I don't think it's, it's a particular to um, you know, the culture. It's just a different form. So I think whether you're in an Australian corporate or whether you're in other countries, that political game is pretty important in the sense that there will always be people who support you and there will always be people against you. And the more people who support you in positions of influence, the more likely you are going to succeed. Uh, that's, that's the reality. So I don't think Australia is unique in that. Now, being an Asian in a um, Australian, I guess, commercial context, I think one of the disadvantages that you have um, that it's just just a typical conversation that you often find around um, what 
what people talk about. What I tend to find is when we start when they start talking about cricket or sport or other things, Asian people tend not to be as knowledgeable about that. So the ability to, I guess, um, gather that cohort who aligns with you is probably a bit less. I think that's right. We're, whereas if you're in a certain culture, everybody's kind of in the same boat. Um, also, as I said, like attracts like. There's not as many people like you in Southern Asia or Southern African Asia. So you're obviously going to have a fat group there. Um, it just means that you have to try harder. Um, and that's just a reality. But not just harder in terms of meritocracy. This is a mistake I see a lot of young people make. They go, try harder, and after a certain point, meritocracy works. You bring in more revenue, you bring in more clients, you get to the director level. But to get to the partner level at a certain place, it's not just about what knowledge you've got. It's about, are you, have you got your supporters? Um, and that is a point which you realize, wait a minute, have I built up the network of supporters irrespective of my um, revenue, of my skills, that is necessary for me to actually go up that level? And that is a good question. Can I, uh, look, uh, I think it's really important to have a, a very good understanding uh, about itself. Um, it is. And I, uh, I know this because um, uh, a former CEO said to me, uh, uh, I'm pretty good at this, Ken, and uh, I've made an assessment in my mind about you. And that is, I don't ever think you're, you're going to become a managing partner. And I'll tell you why. It's because uh, you're not the kind of person who will make indiscriminate decisions that can start off people's lives. And that's what you're going to need to do sometimes. You're not inclined to do that, are you? And I said, well, I'll share with you this, actually. Um, that's very true. And it's very true because, and here's the reason, is um, I'm the youngest child, and um, I, I listen to what my mother says. And um, my mother always said to me, if you think that getting ahead um, by stepping on people um, is the right thing to do, then you're not my son. This has just been something which is very plays in my mind whenever I confront with this kind of situation. And this is the lens I apply to it. So that's just I accept that's the way I am. Another thing you, you know, to, to understand about yourself is, is as, as the youngest child, you know, my role in life for the first 10 years of my life was to, to uh, isolate my brother and sisters, hot buttons, and press them, and then run. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I, 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 you know, a big part of my um, professional career development was actually learning how to, to, to keep that, you know, that bay on. And the temptation is there. Right? So the, the, you've got to know yourself very well to understand um, how people see you. And when you're playing the little game, and this is really important, um, at what point do you stop? Because in certain organisations, you have to play the game in a certain way, which goes against your values. And so the decision you have to make at the point is do I compromise my values in order to get those roles? Or do I stop, stay in the organisation, or do I leave? And I think that's a really important decision. Um, is if you're from a certain cultural background or you have certain value systems, and the organisation that you're in, you need to, you know, I guess, break that in order to succeed. Then there's a question that you need to ask yourself: Is, is it all worth it? Um, and sometimes it's not worth. And that's something you just have to say. And you've got to be able to say, you know what, I'm comfortable with that decision. It's unfair, but in the end, you have to make this. Yeah. 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 I'm like, <laughs> absolutely 100% agree because um, uh, if, you, if it goes against the grain of yourself, uh, and you don't want to go there, I, I think that's the time when you have to decide whether you stay or you leave, that's okay, you know? So some things in life are not worth it. So um, it, it depends on what kind of person you are, what kind of what your ambitions are. Uh, you know, every person is different. And it's a, it's a very personal, very subjective thing. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, just wanted to say a really big thank you for coming over. I personally found a lot of things which you said uh, applies to myself, uh, a lot of wisdom. Um, I 
think it was around being able to adapt uh, in situations where you act in a certain way in your role. Uh, so being able to get the, getting those skills for the next role, the next two roles, uh, surrounding yourselves with people who uh, think differently to you, looking for a win-win situation, uh, taking risks. If you go for the next role, or when I look for the next role, and if I don't get that role, quit. Uh, don't stay where I'm at. Um, stick up for myself uh, and believe in myself. And also build a network, so making sure that uh, you all make yourself interesting, uh, understand uh, your priorities, and uh, also uh, if prompt that's an interesting, always have a joke in a serious situation. Um, and if you want, then let's get a government job. <laughs> <laughs> So on behalf of PDF, uh, I really want to thank uh, Charles Cho, um, Ken, as well as Rahul. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it was really difficult to get that time in one, at uh, one um, get one time slot where everyone was available, but uh, managed to make that happen. We also wanted to thank uh, the city of Sydney uh, for hosting us with the Lunar Festival. So. Uh, all those who are watching at home, um, scared of coronavirus, so uh, we'll put that up online sometime soon. And thank you to everyone who attended, despite the fears.